<clears throat> I'm going to start. Um, this talk is Through the Wire, a Measurement and Improvement of a Software-Based IPSEC Implementation. This is work that uh, I've been doing with Jim Thompson, who's also here. So, start off with our standard boilerplate about networking. Oh, and my apologies, I'm going to walk back and forth like I usually do. Um, so benchmarks are hard, uh, just for anyone who's ever really tried to do one, uh, for a bunch of reasons. One is, um, you know, often people who are building benchmarks don't really know what they're trying to measure, uh, and you really want to pick something that's reproducible and easy to see changes in. If your benchmark is too broad, then you're, you know, not going to learn anything about what's going on. Um, you want to know how you're going to measure it. You want to verify your measurements. Um, the number of people who post to mailing lists saying, I've made something faster, <clears throat> and then have one measurement is uh, unfortunately a very large number of people. So um, you want to have something that's reproducible. You want to be able to verify that measurement over time. You want that measurement to be repeated, but you also want that measurement to be replicated by someone else. And one of the things that we've been working on uh, in various parts of the network stack and in network measurement recently is has been to make it so that our measurements are uh, replicable and replicate them. Uh, other people can take the work that we've done, run the same work, and you know say, oh well, you know, I found something different, or I found the same thing. Hopefully, what you find is that they find the same thing. Um, next is relevance, right? So you know, an important part of picking how you do a benchmark is picking something relevant. Right? Often, people will you know. They'll say, well, we're going to make some part of it faster. Benchmarks are always about making something faster. Nobody tries to run a benchmark to make it slower, hopefully. Um, but you want to have a relevant measurement, right? So you, you know, so one of the things that people in networking in particular get wrong is the difference between bandwidth and latency, right? Because those are two different things. And you can really improve your latency and not always improve your bandwidth and you can improve your bandwidth and not improve your latency. So whatever measurement you're going to pick to do your benchmark, you want to make sure that it's relevant to the thing that you're trying to optimize. Um, and you know, in a general purpose operating system like for BSD, uh, you know, what we want to optimize is everything, but you don't get to do that. And you're usually going to do one thing at a time. Uh, next is workload generation. So uh, one of the most common pitfalls I've seen in people doing benchmarks is they happen to have a workload that is representative for them, right? So, you know, they're a web server company and they really care about TCP connections and that's all they measure, right? They make a bunch of changes to the network stack or, you know, since we're talking about networking, I'm going to keep talking about the network stack. Um, and it makes their particular workload go faster, which is great, but then they've modified a general purpose OS that everyone else is using, and they break a bunch of other things, or they make a lot of other things slower, um, because they don't have a sufficiently broad set of workloads. Um, one of the nice things on an open source project is if we get enough people with enough different types of um, applications, then we should have the ability to get people to replicate our results or run our results with various workloads, which gives us a better picture um, for you know, how we've improved uh, the system. Finally, um, a lot of the measurement technologies we use when we're trying to find bottlenecks in the system, and I'll talk about this a little bit later in the, in the discussion, uh, the measurement technologies themselves disturb the thing we're measuring. So, there's this term called a Heisenberg, which comes from Heisenberg uncertainty for anyone who's ever taken a physics class. Um, but you can also have Heisen testing, right? So you, you actually take a measurement, and the act of taking the measurement changes the performance of the system. Most people actually expect that if you have this problem, it simply slows the measurement down. But you can actually apply tools to a system which will cause it to run faster uh, in certain cases. In particular, if your um, code was, if you force the code to remain only on a single core, and you don't realize you're doing that. If you want to do that on purpose, that's fine. But you might wind up actually having uh, higher performance when you apply the, the measurement technology, whatever that measurement, te measurement technology is. 
usually the measurement technology slows down your uh, measurement. Um, and the worst case is when it's not a linear slowdown. Right? So you apply something to you know the code, and you're like, okay, well, tell me what's going on, and the code you know, moves fewer packets in our case. Um, and it's sort of acceptable if it moves 10% fewer packets, but it's not acceptable if it moves 50%, then 30%, then 50% over time. That bounces around and you get jitter. It's really going to mess up uh, your measurements. And so you, the goal is to minimize the effect of the measurement technology on the measurement you're trying to make. So these are a, a bunch of pitfalls, not just for networking, but for any benchmark. I mean, you can benchmark file systems this way. You could you know, benchmark memory access, VM. Um, these are sort of just general things about benchmarking that makes benchmarking difficult. Unless, of course, you do marketing, in which case the benchmark can be completely made up. But let's not do that. So uh, network benchmarks are more difficult than, say, some other benchmarks. Certainly a benchmark that's on a single system is easier than benchmarking a distributed system uh, for these uh, four reasons. So asynchrony. Um, while we have asynchrony in the kernel, for many things. Um, asynchrony in networking is uh, orders of magnitude worse because it could be that you're, you know, if you're, say, a CDN or something that's using the public internet, asynchronous events can occur milliseconds apart, which in, you know, a modern processor is almost forever. Um, and so trying to predict and handle that asynchrony uh, is non-trivial. The next is the fact that almost all network technologies, and certainly internet, the internet protocols, are what we call best effort delivery. So Kirk, who's actually in the audience, uh, likes to point out that in file systems, if you ever lose someone's data, they will never trust you again. In networking, eh, not so much. So you give us a packet, and we drop it. And you give us another packet, we drop it. And you give us another packet, and we deliver it. Um, this best effort delivery means that, that there's another measurement you have to make uh, that you might not have to make in certain other systems. So if you were benchmarking a memory system, um, the system would halt if the, you know, the memory didn't get delivered to wherever it was going. But if, if operating systems halted when they didn't receive packets, all of your operating systems would have, would have halted by now. Um, so one of the other measurements we often have to take is not only how much data got through, but how much data didn't get through. So that makes, I think it makes uh, network benchmarks harder. I'm eventually going to have to remove this line from this slide, um, because when I gave, when I started giving this series of talks, um, and I started searching for open source tools for controlling distributed systems, there were very few. Uh, Marcel is in the front of the room, so he's written one. I've written one. Uh, but also, it turns out, it, one of the nice things about giving talks at conferences is you can make these like sweeping statements. There are no open source tools. And then four or five people email you, and they're like, we have an open source tool. And you're like, really? Where is it? Well, we've never actually put it anywhere. Marcelo put his stuff on GitHub, so did I. But I got three or four mails after the first one of these. Well, we wrote one of those. Uh-huh. Where is it? It's in a private repo. That's not helpful. Um, so eventually, I'll get to remove this line. Um, Lastly, the thing that uh, makes network benchmarks more difficult than a benchmark on a single, you know, executing a benchmark on a single box, is the nature of distributed systems. So, even a simple benchmark, like I'm going to show later in this talk, where we're looking at, um, you know, IPsec forwarding, requires, you know, a controller and four hosts, and the coordination of those four hosts. And the way people have done this in the past has been SSH, right? So I've got six terminals open. And I've logged into my six machines, and I'm going to go run, 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 and then that's going to be my test. Um, and that makes doing things like replicating the test really hard, um, and that's a really bad way to do things, um, but it is the way that a lot of people have done stuff. And then there's been plenty of ad hoc uh, shell and Perl scripting, and you know, I wrote my stuff in Python, and I think uh, Marcel has things in Python. Uh, Python's much better than Perl. I'm going to also make that sweeping statement. Um, but so controlling distributed systems is, is difficult because, you know, what happened, you know, how do you detect when one of them fails, right? Um, and if you look at, 
Um, if you look at uh, you know doing a real distributed systems test, so you know doing something where you're testing thousands of nodes in a data center, or testing you know across long distances, that introduces a very significant challenge to this kind of work. Another challenge of doing uh, networking benchmarks is just the raw performance that we're now looking at. So one of the you know, the work that I'm doing on uh, network performance is looking at 10, 40, and we now have 100 gig hardware in the Centex uh, uh, test cluster for the FreeBSD project, which FreeBSD project members have access to. So we're looking at very fast machines um, that have some very interesting uh, differences to the way machines worked when the original protocols were written. Right. So if you look at um, the cost of instructions versus the cost of cache misses. In modern hardware, the cache miss is the expensive thing now. I mean, most people who you know go through sort of an undergraduate CS degree and look at you know what how software is built still have a you know a pre 2010, probably a pre 2000 view of what is the expensive thing in a system. Uh, for networking and for a lot of this high performance stuff now. The expensive thing is the cache. It's not the instructions. Instructions are cheap, right? Um, so on a, you know, when I first started uh, building the, the test lab in 2008, eight years ago, you know, 10 gig was sort of that was the high speed network connector. Um, you can now buy a 10 gig NIC for about 250 US dollars. So they are available to even the smallest nuclear nation. Um, and you know, one of these is already pushing 14.8 million packets at 64 byte packets per 64 byte packets. Um, that means we have 67 nanos for 200 cycles and 300 gigahertz to deal with it. And a cache miss on one of those processors is 32 nanos. So if you have a cache miss, you have blown half of your per packet budget uh, for a time. Um, and that's a, a different world than, say, you know, the old Pentium systems. Um, the other things that, are, that cause uh, us to have issues in doing bench, networking benchmarks, or benchmarks generally, but certainly in networking benchmarks, is this issue of multi-queue and multi-core. The way to make 10, 40, 100 gig mix work on modern processors, because processors are not getting faster, um, is to spread work across multiple queues in the network interface, and then spread that over multiple cores. If you don't line these up, and your benchmark will not be of high fidelity. You will not get good results. What you'll get is what I would call bouncy results. There's probably a better statistical name for that. But you will see your results vary wildly across uh, any one test. And so that's not going to give you a really good uh, idea of what's going on in the system. And in order to do high fidelity benchmarking for networking at this point, you have to know a lot about the underlying architecture. So. Uh, the classic example of this at the moment is, you know, we talk in FreeBSD about what we're going to do about NUMA, right? We've done some things about non-uniform memory architectures. And most of the people who think about NUMA think, well, and, and I do this quite often when I'm dealing with people who are working with people who are building network appliances, you know, I'll simply say, well, don't use any more than one processor, right? So you've got, until recently, um, if you use a single processor, then you didn't have to worry about non-uniform memory access. But Intel put out a 14, was the, the 12 to 14 core Haswell chip actually on a single chip has NUMA issues. So it's getting harder and harder to get away from the non-uniform memory access issues. And why NUMA matters for all, all of these benchmarks, you realize we've just gone way down into the way the hardware works. Right? And the reason we have to care about this is if the uh, kernel thread or the thread that's executing whatever you're trying to measure, if you're measuring IPSEC or forwarding or TCP or, you know, or you're measuring the file system, any, anything that you're measuring within the kernel, um, if the hardware, if the thread of execution is not near the memory it wants to talk to, then you are going to get lower performance. Um, and again, your, your benchmark isn't going to be a high value. So, Modern hardware is making this more difficult. Um, there's a really nice table that Jim sent me when I was doing this. Um, if you look at packet processing times 
um, by you know packet length, um, and this is, again is a 10 gig. You see that this is the number of cycles we have now. You know, multiply this by four or uh, 10 to get to, to 100 gig, and um, you can see that these cycle budgets are going lower and are going to go lower and lower. Now, most people are not sending huge streams of 64 byte packets. Right? If you are watching video from Netflix or you are interacting with a web server or any of those things, then you are not sending a lot of these. Although, um, I will tell you that the acts coming back are about that size uh, from your traffic. But the outbound packets should be this big. But again, if you go to a 100 gig NIC, what used to be you know, 3,000 cycles on a 3 gigahertz processor is now 300 cycles. So now you've gotten back down into the range of a 64 byte packet. So, you know, and yesterday Luigi was talking about doing things at terabit, which means this would get even smaller. So for my test automation for this uh, set of exercises, I built this thing called Conductor. Uh, it's a set of Python libraries. It's very simple. Um, one might argue it's too simple. Although I did convince the IETF to give me a port number for it. That was a highly amusing experience, which I'm not going to now. Um, so you have a single conductor, right? You've got in front of the room, or a girl in front of the room, waving a baton, uh, and then a set of players. And uh, one of the reasons I went and wrote my own one of these things is that I um, had a very specific set of phases I wanted to, to institute so that you could actually you know, do things that were, uh, were kind of useful for a network test. In particular, this bit of collect. Um, if you're doing a test on a single host, usually the run, the run phase will just dump a bunch of files somewhere and then you'll be able to do that. But if you've got this conductor that has to tell all the players, okay, you've run your test, now give me your results so I can collate them into this, this collect phase. Um, and then this is, by the way, talking about uh, problems people have in implementing benchmarks. They often don't do a reset, right? So someone will run you know, the benchmark 10 times, right? I'm going to run this network measurement 10 times. But the first time you run it, you do all of the setup in the kernel that, that you need to do. You would put your ARP entries in, and your routing entries would be there, and all that stuff. And you either need to throw the first one away, or you need to reset every time so you can get a similar measurement each time. Um, super simple. This is what a conductor config, config looks like. I use the, you know, the standard config language because that made my life easy. Uh, this is the this is a very ugly scripting language. This shows that I am a kernel programmer, not a languages person. Um, but this is you know all of the the phases, right? This is says this startup, run, collect, reset. And this was a test where we were using packet gen to collect a bunch of data on uh, small packets. So this is just an example and. I'll, uh, at the end of the talk, I'll give a link where all of these configurations and all of the scripts actually live. So we've been hosting this all on GitHub. So one of the things you want to do before you start uh, is to generate some baseline measurements. Right? Before we start adding things into the system, we want to uh, you know, establish a baseline. And there are two tools that I've been using to do this so far uh, for TCP-based flows. Uh, iperf, and in particular iperf3, which turns out to be maintained by a former FreeBSD developer, um, and therefore it's easy to get patches in, which is nice, since he knows me. Uh, and second is PacketGen, which is something that Luigi did as a little test program for his NetMap system. So when I want to do very high packet rate, very small packets from a FreeBSD box, I use PacketGen. Um, people have been making new versions of this kind of stuff. Uh, now that there's NetMap and DPDK, which are both sort of both kernel bypass uh, network systems, uh, but these are the two tools that are. If you look at our repo, the two tools we use mostly to to generate packets at the moment. Um, our other choice would be to buy a very expensive piece of hardware like an Ixia, which I have sworn never to do. So let's take a baseline measurement of 10 gig. Um, this is a measurement between two hosts in the test lab, and you can see that. You know, with TCP, uh, this is iperf output. With TCP, we're getting a nice 9.4 gigabits per second. Excellent, right? That, that looks really great. Um, 
Then we do a packet-based measurement with uh, packet gen, and you can see that we're transmitting 14 million packets, but we are not receiving 14 million packets. Um, and, you know, why is that? Well, that's because TCP is working really, really hard to um, balance the bandwidth, right? So in the packet gen case, we are not doing any of the TCP machinery. Um, turns out TCP is very smart. Um, it's not perfect, but in the last 30 years, we've made it so that it actually does a pretty good job of finding the effective bandwidth of a link. Um, and it's doing that by using full-size packets when it can. Um, and so that's, you know, that's an example of a almost a false measurement, right? So great, we can do TCP at full-size packets, but that doesn't tell us a lot about what's going on in the kernel for sort of a general uh, set of a general packet mix. Packetgen uses the abusive minimum size packets, uh, 64 bytes. I mean, Packetgen can use any size. Is right. There are several tests in the currently existing scripts that will do what I call a full spread. If you look for full spread, you'll see it run with 64 bytes and then 128, 256, all the way up to full size packets. And that gives you a better idea of where we're doing better or worse. It'll show cache effects. Um, it shows a lot of interesting stuff. So the device under test can't quite keep up. So let's talk specifically about what you know we measured for this presentation, which is IPSEC. So one of the things that I've been looking at is uh, the performance of various forwarding paths within the kernel. So we've looked at the, you know, the pure IP forwarding path. Um, I guess I should look at some point at the IPv6 forwarding path, especially since I'm standing here in Japan and giving this talk. Uh, but for this, we looked at IPSEC. Um, everyone knows that encryption is computationally expensive. Right? It's kind of designed that way. Um, and so, you know, over time, uh, people have built specialized hardware, specialized uh, coprocessors to handle the complex math for encryption and decryption. And now we even have this in place on CPUs in the in the way in this thing called uh, the AES and I uh, new instructions. AES is a set of uh, encryption and authentication, well, a bunch of encryption protocols, encryption algorithms um, that are designed to be faster in particular than some of the previous uh, algorithms and also designed so that you could e more easily create hardware offload for that. So uh, in modern Intel processors and I believe in some of the ARM V8 processors, probably the stuff from Cavian, you'll get uh, on-chip hardware instructions that implement this AES stuff. So for this set of measurements, we did a, what's a, what I call a four-host setup, which is we have a source, uh, and then we have two VPN endpoints. Right? The source generates packets, one VPN endpoint puts them into a tunnel, the other VPN endpoint pulls them out, and then the sync records how much arrived there. Um, for this set of tests, we used IPR3 using TCP, Conductor sets up the tests, 10 rounds of 10 seconds each. This is what our lab looks like, which is not too much of an eye chart, I hope. Um, I'll talk about these hosts in a moment. So you can see that the, um, this is our VPN tunnel uh, here, and then these machines are our source and our sink. And then we have separate networks. Uh, in the test lab, I try not to do too many back-to-back -to -back links. I'll put in one or two, mostly because in order to get these at the moment, uh, I don't have a big, I don't have a nice complicated uh, fiber switch. To do that, that would be cool. If someone has a fiber switch, like a Gigamon, they want to send me, I will take it. Um, so back-to-back -back links require me to ask someone named Paul to go to the machine and do this. So I'm trying not to set up too many. Um, so we go through the uh, an arrest switch over here, and then these two are still back to back. So this is another thing that's important to state right up front. What was the hardware we were using? Because we were going to see different um, results on different types of hardware. This is some fairly powerful hardware um, in terms of you know not many people are going to uh, dedicate you know an expensive uh, Xeon based server to do this kind of stuff. Um, the Lynx class machines are these 10 core, uh, 2.8 gigahertz. The Rabbit machine is a 3.5, but much smaller core. Um, 
and then Lion is an, an older box, but it's mostly just absorbing the packets that are, are coming through the tunnel. And since the tunnel is already introduced in the bottleneck, Lion is perfectly uh, capable of keeping up with everything that's coming through. That's why it's the packet same. Uh, in terms of uh, network interface cards, we're using Chelsea or T5s. Um, my table wouldn't quite fit if I put the word Chelsea over here, so they're T5 cards, which are the latest cards from Chelsea. Um, those are 10 gig, 10 gig NICs, uh, and then we've got an Intel 10 gig NIC on the packets. So what do we use for our IPSEC baseline? Well, it turns out that IPSEC has, since its inception, our IPSEC code in FreeBSD has had a, a, a null encrypt decrypt, which literally is null. Like, this is the code right here on the slide. Um, nothing happens here. So, um, you know, we wanted to use these null methods to take a baseline so that we could establish what the overhead of just the IPSEC framework is. Right? We know that things like AES and DES and these encryption algorithms are expensive, but how much does it cost just to introduce this framework into the system? Um, you know, the goal should be, or the goal is, that the framework has a very small amount of overhead. Um, so we were going to establish that. It turns out, though, this little side story, that sometime in the last few years, someone had broken the ability to use null because people don't test. And I hate people like that. So I had to go fix the, the null stuff so that the so that set key could actually set null methods. Um, so there's no authentication, no encryption. And the other thing that's important to know is um, you if you want to get a good measurement of the stack's ability to handle things like TCP, you have to turn off the network interface card's hardware offload features. So a modern 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig NIC will have these things like TCP offload, segmentation offloading, that will do a lot of the TCP work for you. Um, in the TCP case, you want to turn that off. Um, and yeah, who needs null encryption, right? You should never have null encryption because the NSA can then read your traffic. Um, turns out they can also read it without null encryption. You need it for testing. So, you know, what do we find? This is in gigabits per second. Um, so we, you know, we ran these 10, 10 measurements and we found that just turning on the framework is going to steal 50% of the overhead. Right? So you are no longer going to be able to move 10 gigs. Uh, you can move slightly less than five, um, which is important for two reasons. One is <laughs> it, it lets us know that we've got a lot of work to do, um, but it also informs the numbers we're going to see on the next set of slides uh, about how well the system operates when we actually reintroduce the encryption and decryption into the system. So. Um, one of the, some of the questions we want to ask once we've started doing these benchmarks are things like, uh, where does the time go? You know, are we, uh, you know, in the null case, there should not be something that's computationally expensive, but we want to know that when we start introducing the encryption and decryption algorithms, you know, what costs? Where, where does the cost come from? Um, and are we, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare a software and a hardware implementation of AES you know, we want to make sure that those instructions that sit on the uh, chip actually are offloading the computation. Um, and finally, we talked about the effect of cache, cache misses. We want to know if we're abusing the caches. Uh, because if we're abusing the caches, then that's, you know, clearly a place that we have to go and optimize the code. I mentioned that we're using the HWPMC subsystem uh, in FreeBSD, which is the subsystem that gives uh, you access to on-chip performance counters. So as chips have become larger and more complex, people haven't figured out what to put on them, as far as I can tell, except more cores. So one of the things that people put on them, which is great, are performance monitoring counters. So back in the old days, the way you did performance monitoring is you built your code with profiling and then the kernel did the performance monitoring for you. And that's very expensive to do that in software. It is better if you can do that in hardware. So HWPMC gives us access to these things on the chip called perf the performance monitoring counters. They will count things like instructions retired, cache misses, 
um, if you were not able to get data quickly enough out of the memory subsystem, you know, out of the actual memory, are you, uh, you know, executing a lot of floating point instructions, which we should not be? Um, you can look at hundreds of different counters uh, now uh, in a chip. You can't look at them simultaneously. You can look at between 8 and 12 simultaneously. Uh, but the things you really care about are things like instructions are tired, cache misses, and uh, cycles. So, um, but it's not free. It has what we call a probe effect. When you turn on HP, HWPMC, the code you're running will run slower um, for reasons. Some of them have to do with the CPU, some of them have to do with the framework itself. You can get this thing called measurement skid. So you can try to take a measurement with PMC, but you will say, well, at this point, take the measurement, but it turns out the processor goes a little past that before it actually records it. You have to know how much that is if you want to get a really fine grain measurement. I'm not going to show a, a measurement that fine in this, but it is important to keep in mind. Um, so it would be great if the measurements you could take with PMC had a really um, well-defined set of tests. Um, and that's not even our problem. I've found that Intel gets this wrong. So if you look at the Intel manuals for PMC, every iteration of the manual is like, oh, that thing we told you you could count? Yeah, that doesn't mean what we said it meant. It means this other thing. And so you wind up having to not only use PMC, but use other tools to, to verify what you've done. Um, and lastly, and this is a, more of a comment on uh, the tools we have available, uh, FreeBSD could use better visualization tools for the output of this. Right now, it's very console-like. Um, kernel programmers should not build user interfaces, in my opinion, and that includes me. Um, but it would be nice if some people could come along and help us with some visualization tools. Because right now, you're, I'll, I'll show you what the visualization looks like. Here's what the visualization looks like right now. Not very visual. Um, so we wanted to run, um, this is the output of HWPMC turned into GProf output. Now, I don't remember what year GProf was put into the system, but I think it was in the 80s. Kirk, Kirk nods, yes. Um, and so what GProf outputs, which is very useful, um, are two uh, profiles. And what it's showing you is, you know, here we are, IP input forward, and then this is part of the IPSEC stuff. And then, you know, this is the total amount this is the total amount of sampled instructions, um, percentage-wise, and then this goes down to the descendants, and you can see that we're not completely accurate, right? We're, we've got some zeros here, which we shouldn't have. Um, and this is just measurement skin and problems in PMC. But we get a rough idea of what's going on. Um, so in the total uh, profile of everything we measured while the system was running the IPSEC test, 64% of everything done was in this set of code, right? Um, I have input, which calls forward, which calls ESP4 input, and then uh, we see a bunch of blocking, and we see a bunch of um, uh, bits where we're getting, this is, uh, we're checking our key, and then finally we're duplicating uh, memory, uh, network packets, and buffs. So, you know, that's useful, I and mean, it would have been very surprising if this was not 64% what was going on. Um, what's more interesting is what's called the flat profile. So the flat profile just sort of lists the, the n things that were at the top. Um, and you see these percentages are much smaller because it's what it's done is it said, oh, this is, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not accumulating these. It's like, oh, these are the things that were most expensive. Now we have, we have some idle time left over. Uh, about 8% of the system is completely idle. Completely idle. Um, what we see here is that the things that are at the top of the list for things that we are doing when we're doing the null forwarding, uh, the null encryption case, are all memory and, and locking, right? It's not about um, bits inside of IP input or IP forward or IPsec. It's all about, you know, clearing out a bunch of memory, grabbing locks, uh, lock and unlock, and then this uh, UMA Z free Z Alex stuff. Um, the UMA uh, lines are for the, the memory subsystems in the kernel. And in a way, this is 
depressing and also not surprising. Right? So, you know, in, in the FreeBSD in FreeBSD and in any of the systems that came from uniprocessor kernels to multiprocessor kernels, you know, we went and we put this thing called the giant lock around the kernel first, and then in FreeBSD 5 we started carving up the kernel into little bits. And the way in which a lot of things get carved up is someone looks at a subsystem and they say, there are 20 data structures that matter. I'm going to put a lock around every single data structure, and then I'm going to figure out how to you know, free that up later. So locking overhead is not surprising to find, but it's going to be fun to remove. Um, because there are definitely places where we can optimize the locks. Um, for those people who spend time in the FreeBSD kernel, you'll notice these are rewrite locks. Um, there are better, more optimized locks, like RM locks, that we might be able to use, uh, but we haven't tried that. So this is good um, because it shows us what to look at. So now let's do some actual encryption. Let's you know build up a IPsec tunnel you might care about, um, you know, in the field as opposed to one that you're just using for testing. So again, now these are um, megabits per second. Um, this is AES CBC with SHA-1 in tunnel mode, um, and this is whether or not we have hardware support. Now the reason to show this particular table is, um, with these, we're, we're not taking advantage of the ASNI instructions. Like with hardware support on and off, we're not actually seeing a, an improvement. In fact, it's pretty much unimproved. Um, but, if we switch to one of the algorithms for which we have hardware offload instructions, these ASNI instructions, like AESGCM, and AESGCM is what people now would feel for an XSEC tunnel, um, you see that we actually get a significant speed up from introducing the hardware. We go from 250 megabits to 1.8 gigs on a 10 gig link. Now, 1.8 gigs is not great on a 10 gig link. You might like to get 10 gigs out of your 10 gig link. Um, maybe that's not completely likely. But we also know that this is not the result just of the encryption and decryption. This is also the result of the overhead of the framework, which we showed in the null case. Right? So the, the framework itself is slowing us down, and then we add the complex math. Um, and of course, we're going to you know, lose more bandwidth. Right? Um, this is the results for uh, 128 bit keys. So where does the time go? Um, this is the case of uh, see, instructions retired for um, a software-based version. That's a flat, flat profile is easier to read. Um, so this is the software-based version of AES GCM. This is without using AES and on. And what you see in the flat profile is, yep, we do a lot of math. Right? These two. Uh, functions up here, GF128 mall and Rindle encrypt. Um, the GF128 mall is a lot of math. But then we see the stuff that we saw before. Uh, copy back data, which is messing with mbuffs, and bcopy and b0. Right? So somewhere we are clearing a lot of memory. Maybe we don't have to clear that memory. Um, maybe if we you know, did something else, like cleared the memory before we started, or reused buffers, or there's a bunch of tricks we can play uh, to start improving some of this. So this is the software case. Um, this is the flat profile when we have um, hardware instructions AES and I enabled. And this should look very familiar to you. Um, what's nice is we've got a bunch more idle time back, which means we have more time on the system to do other things. And most of what we find in the flat profile, again, are things like the locks, uh, the copies, and the UMA stuff. And what this tells us is that the AES and I stuff is working, right? It has removed all of the math overhead, and we're back to dealing with just the overhead of the framework. So if we were to improve the overhead of the IPsec framework itself, we would also improve the overall measurement that we have back here. This number would go up. Um, this number also should go up, but this number would go up really significantly because that's all that's interfering. All, that's most of what's interfering with us getting more bandwidth through the system is, again, this is the framework. So, math is hard, let's go shopping. Um, in the hardware offload case, we do see that the CPU is free for other work with this hardware assist. Um, 
And as I said, Lockheed and memory management dominate. This confirms our suspicions from the null measurements. Uh, but this last line is really important. So the FreeBSD kernel is a packet at a time kernel. We do not batch packets. And you know, this goes all the way back to my earlier conversation of optimizing for latency versus bandwidth. In a latency sensitive system, which we are not talking about right now, you might prefer packet at a time because then the, pack, the next packet will come out as soon as possible. If you were to back, batch packets, say we, say we were to wait for 16 packets, um, then the first packet wouldn't come out until the 16th was done. But we would get a significant speed up from not locking and unlocking data structures for every single packet that went through the system. We would remove that overhead. Um, so one of the places to look, and one of the things I'm going to be looking at after this talk, is any places where we can think about batching data through the system. It might be that we start with batching data through IPsec itself so that we don't perturb the rest of the network stack. Um, but batching data definitely will improve our bandwidth measurements. It will not improve our latency measurements. So bonus measurement. Um, it's been mentioned a couple times uh, for those who are at the Dev Summit. Uh, one of the things that I did a while back was um, the FreeBSD network stack used to have two forwarding paths, which aggravated me a great deal. Um, one was called the fast path, which was off, and one was the regular path. And somehow, shipping a system where fast is off seemed wrong to me. So I went through and I uh, re redid a bunch of the forwarding code to um, make it so that we always tried the fast path first and we only fell back if that failed. Well, there's a bug in that code, um, which we made me go look at some more stuff in it. Um, there's a bug in the, in the try forward code in that if if we happen to have you know two different interfaces with different MTUs, then we lose the information we need to send back to the sender. An error. So that all brought me to this uh, eleven lines of code. So these 11 lines are in the beginning of the forwarding, the traditional forwarding path. Um, and in the try forward path, we, have, we avoid them because we don't save a copy of the packet for an error. Um, we don't save a complete copy, a deep copy of the packet. Um, and when I went to look at this and you know, added this back into the, into the new forwarding path, and uh, then I made a bunch of these measurements, I was like, well, how much does that cost? Well, I'll tell you that it's not free. Um, but I won't tell you the answer. You'll have to come to Ottawa to find the answer. But I can tell you that everywhere in the network stack that we do something like this, where we grab a, you know, grab a new header or duplicate a packet, this is really expensive. We really need to stop doing this everywhere because this is costing us a lot of time. And that's going to require us to restructure a bit about how we think about memory in the network stack. And then the network stack is really designed such that you know, we just sort of I wouldn't say it's naive, but I would say it's very linear, right? Something happened, we got some data, we're going to put it in a thing, we're going to look at a lock, we're going to look at another lock, we're going to put it in another thing, and then we're going to make a decision. As opposed to we're going to pre-allocate certain things ahead of time because we know that certain things might happen. So come to Ottawa in June, and I will tell you the results. Um, well, I've got one minute left, but that's okay. I won't make you late for lunch, don't worry. Um, so this is all part of what I'm calling an ongoing longitudinal study, also known as I get to poke at things and then present them at conferences. Um, we're running this continuously. Actually, I, I did not intend that to be a pun, but for those in the room who understand English, it is. Um, reporting this out several times a year. Uh, so I gave this, I gave a talk on a different set of measurements in Asia BSD, Con BSD, Can. Jim gave the talk at Euro BSD this year. Uh, or last year, not last year, and then you know, we've done this, and there'll be one more um, coming up in June, and we're going to just keep doing this until we run out of things to optimize. So that means I have a job for life, I guess. <laughs> it's never going to be done. Um, there's a lot of work to do. But I did mention that um, all of the scripts and all the stuff uh, that we've been working on for the last couple of years are up in GitHub. They are. Um, they're, in, they're currently in my personal GitHub. Uh, in the NetPerf repo. Please send me pull requests. Please send me more scripts. I'm going to be looking at uh, Zapkyo on Monday and possibly re replacing Conductor if it works better. I looked at a couple of other frameworks. DPDK has a testing framework, which is 
interesting, but just odd. So I'm hoping for something in between Conductor, which is really simple, and the DPDK one, which is really complex and kind of depends on a lot of features of DPDK that I don't want to deal with. Um, so this is my last slide. Are there any questions? Are you all awake? Are any of you awake? <laughs> all right, well, you can all go have lunch then. Thank you very much.